Alright guys, so welcome back, AP Biology Unit 3, and we're going to be talking about cellular energetics, and what you need to do, know for this unit. Okay, I hope everyone's safe, and let's get started. So, just like always, we're going to look over the rubric by AP Central, and we're going to go through each each individual unit, and try. I'll try my best to tr explain each one. Alright, so first one is enzyme structure. What is an enzyme, and how is it structured? So enzymes are catalytic proteins, which means they catalyze reactions, and they allow for lower activation energy of a reaction. The activation energy is the energy required to get that reaction to occur. Some characteristics of these enzymes uh, include globular, they're globular proteins with tertiary structure, and we'll learn about different types of structure later. They're named after the substrate they uh, either separate or join, plus the suffix ACE, A-S-E, uh, they can be reused over and over again, and the bonding of an enzyme and its substrate, or the molecule it's splitting, forms an enzyme-substrate complex. Also, these enzymes catalyze in both directions, so they can either join two molecules or separate them apart. Lastly, some require assistance from some cofactors and coenzymes, which we'll, we'll discuss more about in the next slide. Uh, the transition state is the molecular state, is a molecule state when it has the energy to react. And again, a substrate is just a molecule that's being split or broken or joined. And the active site is the site on the enzyme where the molecules will bind to. And together, it's called an enzyme-substrate complex. Okay, so three ways in which enzymes work. First is induced strain. This is the, so the induced fit model. It shows how the protein or the enzyme actually transforms when the substrate enters the active site. So that way it fits better and will work. <laughs> uh, substrate orientation. It brings together and orients specific atoms in the substrate to so bonds form easier. And then finally, adding chemical groups. It will add side chains of enzymes involved in the reaction. It also has cofactors that help the enzyme function. These cofactors um, include metal ions, copper, zinc, iron, and they bind to participate in the reactions. Without these cofactors, the reaction could not occur. Um, coenzymes, these are small carbon containing molecules. They bind to the active site and adds or removes chemical groups that are necessary for the uh, transformation. Finally, prosthetic groups like prosthetic arms, they're organic molecules permanently bound to the enzyme. Permanently. Okay. Finally, you need to know what, a met what our metabolism is. Uh, metabolism is simply the sum of all chemical reactions in a cell. Uh, catabolism is the breaking down of molecules and Anabolism is the building up of molecules, and catabolism and anabolism both work together in, uh, and they occur in entire pathways. These pathways consist of multiple enzymes and multiple uh, different molecules, and they serve a function and is controlled by enzymes. Okay, so next one, enzyme catalysis. Catalysis. Okay, so uh, there's a few ways that we control enzymes in our body. And that's by competitive inhibition. That's one way. Competitive inhib inhibition inhibitors. Wow, they mimic the substrate, and they actually bond to the active site. So that prevents the bonding of the substrate. If the substrate can't bond to the enzyme, then it cannot be separated or joined together. There's also non-competitive -compet inhibition, which is uh, which consists of allosteric regulators, which bind to a site other than the active site. So it doesn't directly sit in the site where the substrate goes. It's, it's in another site that's located on the enzyme. This actually causes the protein to change its shape and make it so the substrate cannot bind to that enzyme. Feedback inhibition is where the end product, so what the enzyme creates, actually stops the enzyme from creating more. This helps just to make sure that the cell doesn't break apart too many of the molecules. Otherwise, um, the body wouldn't be able to function, depending on the function necessary. Lastly is cooperativity. It's just the binding of one substrate molecule to one active site of one subunit of the enzyme, which causes a change in the entire molecule and locks all subunits into an active position. To, uh, it basically activates the enzyme and opens up different active sites sometimes, allowing for the amplification of the production, making more and more substrate or end product if needed. Okay. 3.3. Easy. Environmental impacts on enzyme function. So, two major environmental impacts is just temperature and pH. Uh, temperature, if it's too high of a temperature, it will actually denature the protein. 
Each protein works best at certain temperatures. That's why the human body actually regulates these temperatures using homeostasis. pH is the amount of pH that affects so the amount of pH affects enzyme structures. Too much pH, too little pH can cause the enzyme to also denature and therefore be infunctional. Denature basically means the enzyme breaks apart. <laughs> enzymes have different properties allowing them allowing them to survive or work in different concentrations. And lastly, animals adapt to different concentrations by releasing isozymes. These are enzymes that do the same exact things but can actually but have different properties. So they can exist in different temperatures or different pHs, allowing those animals to survive when the perfect conditions aren't met. Okay, cellular energy. So just a few things about energy. Uh, it's a complex transformation. So energy. <laughs> uh, complex transformations are, res are results of multiple smaller reactions. So the cell can't um, completely um, have a molecule react to get the energy, because if it does, most of the energy will go into heat. This will lead to combustion and that would be very bad for the cell. So what the cell does is actually breaks it in, into multiple smaller reactions. And it will actually gain as much energy as it can, turn into ATP, from these smaller reactions. Um, there's, so we're going to talk about two laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. And the second law of thermodyn thermodynamics is that energy is lost in transfer. So whenever energy is transferred from one source to another, it's lost, usually in the form of heat, which is why there's multiple smaller reactions rather than one big one, because too much of the energy would have been lost. Lastly, exergonic reactions releases energy. So, for example, ATP being split into ADP and phosphorus, and endergonic reactions absorb energy, like ADP and phosphorus joining together to make ATP. As the next one shows, ATP hydrolysis, it's how the cell releases energy. And basically what it does is it takes adeno, yeah, adenine diphosphate and phosphorus and makes adeno trisphosphate. And this stores energy. So this converted back into ADP and phosphorus to release energy. It does this by a hydrolysis reaction, which basically it takes the ATP, adds water, and forms ADP, phosphorus, and free energy. Also, in some cases, ATP can be transferred into adenomonophosphate and diphosphate. Okay, so redox reactions. What is a redox reaction? Well, it, just split the word into two parts, red and ox. Reduction is the gain of one or more electrons. Now, it's weird to think that the, a reduction is a gain, but technically it's a reducing in charge. And oxidation is actually the loss of an electron. They always occur together. So whenever something loses or oxidates, the other one reduces or goes under or gains an electron. Uh, a specific carrier that we can talk about is NAD+, which is reduced to NADH, meaning it gains an electron. And finally, there's also others known as NADPH, which is in plants, and FAD. Okay, so let's go into the process of photosynthesis. I'm sure you guys know all about this already. Okay, so... This is a basic diagram showing photosynthesis. Water and carbon dioxide come in, oxygen and sugar come out. There's light reactions and light independent reactions, which is also known as the Calvin cycle. The light reactions produce NADPH and ATP for use. The Calvin cycle then, again, takes ATP, and like we said, hydrolysis, it turns, turns into ADP and phosphorus, and it takes NADPH, um, takes the electron from this, and turns it into NADP+. Okay, so the formula for photosynthesis is 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus energy into glucose plus 6O2. It's composed of light-dependent reactions, which use the photon from the sun, and light-independent reactions, which use energy to create molecules. Photosynthetic pigments, are, they absorb light energy in the light-dependent reactions, and they provide energy to carry out the rest of photosynthesis. These pigments... Um, they, their names include chlorophyll A and B. This chlorophyll, this is one of the main um, pigments in plants. It absorbs red, blue, and violet range of light. Carotenoids are another type of pigment, and they're yellow, orange, and red in color, and they absorb blue, green, and violet. The reason they're yellow, orange, and red is because they reflect that wavelength of light, and they absorb the colors that they are not. Xanthophyll is another one. Um, absorption spectrum is a spectrum we use that shows a wavelength of light, and 
and it shows which ones are absorbed. And the action spectrum actually measures the rate of photosynthesis dependent on the wavelength that is receiving. Okay, so what is the actual structure of chloroplasts? The chloroplast is inside our cells and it basically facilitates photosynthesis or light um, dependent reactions. The chloroplast consists of thylakoids. Thylakoids are membranes. It, the, the membrane of the thylakoids is the site of photosystems. Uh, there's where light dependent reactions occur and they're stacked in grana. In this picture you can see that these stacks, uh, these stacks right here, it's thylakoid and there's each each one is a thylakoid and they're stacked in granums. Grana. Uh, inside the thylakoid is the lumen. Um, the fluid is called a stroma. So this fluid right here, and that's basically inside the chloroplast, is called a stroma. And what happens is the um, electron transport chain and photosynthesis, they actually, or sorry, just photosynthesis, the light dependent reactions occur across this membrane where they create a concentration gradient and then release it to form ATP. And we'll, all, we'll see that all later. Um, again, the chloroplast is actually double membrane, which is, uh, we believe that the chloroplast was part of a different living organism and was assimilated into us. That's why it has a double uh, membrane, or assimilated to plants. That's why it has a double membrane. This is the inner membrane space, the outer membrane, inner membrane, and yeah. Okay, so photosystems. Photosystems are um, another part, a big part of uh, light-dependent photosynthesis. So photosystems, photosystems are light harvesting complexes with a reaction center, which contains chlorophyll A, like we talked about earlier, that pigment. Photosystem two, it, it comes first, and it absorbs light best at 680 nanometers. It's weird that photosystem two is the first, but technically it was discovered second. That's why they named it photosystem two. And then PSI, or photosystem one, is next and absorbs light best at 700 nanometers. So let's talk about how these photosystems work in the light dependent reaction. So there's one, there's two ways these uh, photosystems work. One is called the non cyclic flow. Basically, photosystem two absorbs energy and passed it to the reaction center. In the reaction center is chlorophyll A. This enters an excited state and loses the electron to reduce an electron receptor. So let's see this picture right here. Light is striking. This will actually release an electron, which will then move throughout the electron tra transport chain. So this is chlorophyll right here. Okay, so the chlorophyll plus, since it's now lost an electron, and remember, it's been oxidized or underwent oxidation. It grabs an electron from H2O, splitting it into oxygen and hydrogen. This is why water is necessary for plants. This is called photolysis. And you can see that right here. H2O is then split into oxygen and hydrogen. Electrons pass through the electron transport chain, forming a gradient on the inside of the thylakoid. So what does this mean? Uh, as we said, the electron is then moved through the electron transport chain or this protein channel. This protein channel then takes hydrogen and actually pushes it to this side using the energy from the electron. Now there's a concentration gradient. There's more H plus ions here and less here. When there's a concentration gradient, the molecules always want to move from location of higher to lower. So later you'll go through a channel, ATP synthase, which is the only method out. And it actually goes through the ATP synthase, causing this um, area, I guess, this subunit to spin. And the spinning motion of this causes ADP and phosphorus to turn to ATP. I think I got ahead of myself, but <laughs> ATP synthase allows the movement of protons, so H plus ions, into the stroma. And uh, the stroma is this outside. And this is the lumen. And this is the thylakoid membrane. Um, and photosystem 1 gets electrons from photosystem 2. And it energizes again for electron transport chain. And it ends with NADPH formation. So yeah, uh, photosystem one actually converts NADP to NADPH. Okay, there's here's the just a quick um, demonstration of what's happening. So again, water gets split, electron moves through, uh, H plus is then put into the concentration gradient. It goes through ATP synthase, forming ATP. Okay, there's also a thing called cyclic flow, and cyclic flow is basically since photosynthesis needs more ATP, PSI one loops through. The, loops electrons through the electron transport chain to produce ATP, which means it just continuously loops through one photosystem instead of creating both. 
Okay, now back now to the light independent reaction. This is no this is also known as the Calvin cycle. So a Calvin cycle has three parts. One is fixation. It takes carbon dioxide and it adds to a five carbon acceptor, uh, RUBP, which causes the break which causes its breakdown into two three PGs and or three carbons. And that's done by an enzyme known as Rubisco. Rubisco is probably the most important enzyme you'll need to know for this photosynthesis, but uh, reduction then occurs, which it takes 3PG and turns G3P, and then regeneration, which basically G3P ends up as RUMP, which is then converted back to RUBP, which remember is the acceptor. And this process creates one extra G3P, which is then exported out into the cytosol for conversation to hexosis. Photorespiration. Photorespiration is when RUBP attaches to oxygen instead of CO2. The issue here is that the entire point of this cycle is to get that carbon, that extra carbon that comes with C. O2 is actually diffused, if you remember from a lot earlier, it's actually um, diffused through the membrane and out of the plant. However, it's the carbon that we need. Uh, let's see where was I was. Okay. Um, yeah, and it basically produces useless products and that have to be broken down, making the cell use, or sorry, the plant use even more energy than it needs to. And then finally, C4 synthesis is for those plants that um, that live in hot, dry weather. And these plants need to hold on to as much water as they can. So the stomata, which is facilitates exchange of water, only opens when needed during the night, when it's cooler. Wow, cellular respiration, okay. So the formula for cellular respiration is glucose plus 6O2 is converted to 6CO2 plus 6H2O and energy. So there's the anaerobic section. There's two types of er, anaerobic respiration. So two types of anaerobes is facilitated, which can co tolerate oxygen environment. They just don't use the oxygen. And the obligate, they can't live in a, an environment containing oxygen. Glycolysis occurs always. It's a six, it takes a six carbon monosaccharide glucose and then converts it to two three carbon pyruvate molecules. Fermentation, it can only work if there are NAD plus to accept the electron. It consists of glycolysis and a way to turn NADH into NAD plus. Uh, lactic acid fermentation converts pyruvates from glycolysis into lactic acid, lactate, and CO2, turning NADH into NAD plus. An example is in the human muscles when you're running um, and you get tired your body cannot quickly access the store of energy it has so what it does is and uh, undergo fermentation where it constantly is just breaking down glucose in your body and turning it into NADH and turning NADH into NAD plus um, when you run out of NAD receptors you actually cannot continue fermentation which you need to take a breath uh, that Oxygen then takes away the lactic acid, lactate, and makes it leave your body. Uh, yeah, build up on, it builds up until oxygen returns and lactate is converted back to pyruvate. Alcoholic fermentation, it converts pyruvate from glycolysis into ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide, basically turning NADH into NAD+. Example is yeast. Okay, and then aerobic cellular respiration. Uh, so we already talked about glycolysis and it occurs in the cytoplasm without oxygen, we know that, and it produces 2 ATP and 2 NADH. All right, citric acid cycle, also known as a Krebs cycle. I always have an issue distinguishing Krebs cycle and the uh, Calvin cycle, but Krebs cycle is for respiration and Calvin is for photosynth er, photosynthesis. Okay, so this occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, which is this area right here. This is where the um, Krebs cycle occurs, and basically take it's consists of pyruvate oxidization, which both pyruvates are converted to acetate uh, plus coenzyme A, forming acetyl coenzyme A. And then ox yeah, that receives the two carbon from acetyl CoA, which begins the cycle until back to oxacetate. It reduces NAD plus and FAD plus into NADH and FADH2. And here is the image. Okay, the electron transport chain. Um, it occurs in the cristae membrane, the inner membrane. The electron transport chain carries electrons from any. Oh, cristae membrane, by the way, is right there. 
it's basically this yellowish section section. Okay, so the electron trans carries electrons from NAD slash FAD through the electron transport protein, which use energy to pump hydrogen ions into inner membrane space. Uh, this creates a concentration gradient, which then, you know. <laughs> the final acceptor of electrons is oxygen, which receives electrons and 2H plus protons to form water. Redox reactions, uh, NADH is oxidized, NAD plus, and O2 is reduced. Just keep putting that out there. And then NADH provides more energy for ATP synthesis than FADH2, uh, and it forms an, a proton gradient. Oxidative phosphorylation and chem chemiosmosis. Oxidative phosphorylation, phosphorylation of ADP to ATP, caused by oxidation of NADH and FADH2. The protons move down the proton gradient through ATP synthase channels. The flow causes it to spin like a motor and phosphorylate ADP into ATP. All right, unit three is finished. Oh, I had a hard time explaining the uh, cellular respiration photosynthesis. I might, I might make a video on that going closer. But thank you for watching. I hope this helped. Sorry it was so long. S subscribe and like, and I'll see you next time.